let me um, point to another course resource. I don't know if I've pointed to this before. I don't think I have. In the past semesters, I've mentioned uh, Maxwell's de demon in thermodynamics context, but I, I don't remember bringing it up this semester, so I don't think I might have. Um, so this is a really classic resource on learning physics for lower division physics students. That means, you know, physics majors and future engineers, not just the physics majors. And um, this is a resource that you used to have to pay for it. But I forget when they started doing it, but uh, Caltech started just uh, putting this on a website for free access. I mean, it's not... Um, it's not OER, like I can't, uh, it's still copyrighted. I don't have legal permission to just copy and paste the text of this into my web page. <laughs> but um, it, it's free for you to read. So, um, so it's all here. It's a great resource. And I guess um, if you don't know who uh, Richard Feynman is, um, it's a, he's a uh, he's a Nobel laureate. I think he won a Nobel Prize for his work on path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, and um, and in the U.S. household, he became a household name um, through his role in as part of the I guess advisory committee investigating the U.S. Uh, as a Challenger disaster. It's some um, shuttle accident back in the. I forget when, 60s, 70s, um, he had, in one of his writings, he talked about doing a little mini experiment with an O-ring. Uh, he dunked it in an ice water to demonstrate that O-ring does lose its flexibility when it's cold. And so, it, anyways, I guess none of that is relevant for our, he's, uh, um, what's uh, wonderful about uh, Mr. Fein or Professor Feynman is uh, he's a really good physics communicator. And um, he's a really good physics communicator, both to um, people who are majoring in physics and to general public. Uh, because the thing about physics communication is, um, especially in popular science, in popular science, you see a lot of, um guess I could call it misinformation, uh, misinformation, even from physicists. Um, there are certain professional physicists who do um, go on media and publish popular science books. You will never hear me mention because I really think they water down the physics so much that what they communicate isn't physics at all. Uh, Feynman is one of the rare physicists who, whether they are talking to fellow physicists or whether they are talking to general member of the public who hasn't gone through the years of training that physicists and engineers do, he's still um, uh, talking about the core important concept. He never communicates something that if a professional physicist heard it, would think, hey, that's just not the right thing at all. You are watering your uh, really distorting what the actual physics picture is, either in order to overhype your own research or, um, or to gain more popularity. <laughs> uh, so, so Feynman is a really great uh, physics communicator, and uh, much of what is known for is not this set of lectures, but uh, for our purposes, it's these lectures that are really useful. Now, I say useful, but with a bit of a caveat. Um, so even though this is technically a textbook that's uh, accessible for free, uh, you'd never see me using this as a textbook. Uh, one of the reasons for it is uh, it, he uses a really unconventional order. His chapter one. Uh, so if you think back to your own physics foray, your chapter one would have covered the things like units or what is um, uh, you know physics as a fundamental science, and there might be have been some discussion of vectors, and that's the standard introduction to engineering, calculus-based physics. And Feynman starts out with this, atoms in motion. And um, I think in this section is where he has that famous line of, if uh, all the, um, if there's a great catastrophe in the world, then uh, we lose basically the whole civilization. And your goal is to communicate in the shortest possible sentence or in a single sentence, 
communicate the most possible information, what would you do? And he says it would be the atomic hypothesis that all things are made of atoms. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, so I hope uh, you saw some of this when we were doing thermodynamics, kinetic theory of gas. It, uh, um, it, I can imagine, you know, <laughs> um, if we had some um, more advanced civilization that came before us and they had passed this down to us, then uh, we might not have needed as much time to develop the ideal gas law. Because uh, 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 starting with uh, this uh, surety that a uh, gas is made up of atoms, you can actually, once you um, work out the mechanics and once you have some statistical ideas, then you can derive ideal gas law the way you've seen done in the lecture with the uh, kinetic theory of gas. And, um, and but I think this to say that all of this, uh, maybe chapter two and three are more com uh, conventional order, but things like conservation of energy in physics of 4A, we take like a quarter of the semester to start introducing energy and things like a probability. And, um, and I guess he's now getting to more special theory of relativity. We do that in physics of 4C. And, um, this is a very unconventional order. So, so we wouldn't really use this for a textbook, but, but, what I want to com com uh, recommend this to you as is as a supplemental resource. If uh, as you're going through physics, you've read a textbook and maybe you watched the lectures or maybe you didn't, but you know, lectures cover more or less what the textbook does. And maybe you feel like you understand some of the physics, but maybe there's something that to maybe puzzling. Sometimes the most challenging thing in learning um, learning a new subject like physics is when you don't even know what you don't understand. <laughs> and um, and um, if that describes you, then this can be a wonderful resource, um, either to highlight some areas where you could understand better, or maybe to explain um, some things in a better way than I could. As I was saying, really the remarkable thing about Feynman was just how good a communicator he was of these uh, complex, uh, difficult concepts. Both to fellow physicists, physicists and engineers and to general public. So um, I remember when I was in college, um, the first summer um, away from, you know, semester long study, I, I spent uh, the summer just uh, reading through volume one of this and uh, that um, it, it was very uh, eye opening. I mean, by that point, I've uh, done a lot of physics. I think I've taken quantum mechanics, upper division quantum mechanics and all that. And um, and there were some things here that uh, I didn't really fully realize it until I read it in uh, in these lecture notes. So I guess let me highlight the parts that relate to the content of this class. And, <laughs> and as I was saying, uh, he has a very uh, unusual... Um, topic order. So um, so this portion should match to the part of the semester that we just finished with. So that would be ah, here, kinetic theory of gases. So somehow if uh, my lecture of kinetic theory of gases was confusing, try this. Maybe Feynman <laughs> explains it better. Um, and yeah, I, I think this is where I really learned the kinetic theory of gas and just was um, uh, struck by that uh, mechanical connection. Um, I don't really <laughs> remember my lower physics experience, lower division physics experience all that well. So, so I, I forget where I learned the certain things. Um, but um, this is uh, Feynman's coverage of kinetic theory of gas, how we can um, derive things like ideal gas law from mechanical understanding of uh, gas. And uh, and then yeah, principle of statistical mechanics. By the way, the thermodynamics uh, in upper division we call that statistical mechanics. That's to um, 
I think that really emphasizes that uh, in step Mac, you don't have any new laws of physics. Uh, there might be some calculational methods like assembling canonical ensemble and uh, assumption of uh, uh, microstates have the same probability, all that stuff. But those are not really new laws of physics. They are um, statistical, mathematical statements. Um, and yeah, so all that. Things like a diffusion, we never really covered it. So hey, here's a place where you can look and laws of thermodynamics. You know, one thing I... um So Ratchet and Paul is, I think, one that I remember bringing in uh, in some other semesters. And I'm curious of one thing. Under the laws of thermodynamics, if he lists... Okay, so here's the first law. Good. Uh, and I think he has a second law somewhere. Second law, okay. What I want to see is if he keeps bringing in other laws, like uh, depending on where you get your thermodynamic stuff from, people talk about third law, zeroth law, fourth law. That really bothers me. And I want to see if uh, Feynman does this thing that bothers me. Um, it's not like there's anything I can do about it. <laughs> um, it's the global laureate. I'm a community college instructor. Um, and, okay, he hasn't mentioned any third law yet, or he might do it here. Uh, definition temperature. Oh, he might mention third law here. Or not, I don't know. Um, or not. No. Oh. First law, second law. Yeah, he has no other. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He does have this, but not as uh, its own thing. Like sometimes people call it third law, but the thing is, you know, even the first and the second laws of thermodynamics are unnecessary, and this is a quite unusual thing in physics. In physics, we don't often repeat ourselves. Like with the Newton's law, Newton's first law, second law, third law. All those three things, they are almost like uh, axioms of a mathematical system. Uh, and if you are familiar with any uh, axiomatic, uh, axiomatic system, one of the things you do with axioms is you minimize the number of them as much as possible. If there are some things that you can derive from other things, then you don't call those things that you can derive axioms. Those become theorems and lemmas that are derived from the axiom. And um, and the first law and second law of thermodynamics, this is just the same conservation of energy. Uh, so <laughs> we already have that. <laughs> um, and second law, it, it, what, once you cover in statistical mechanics, um, you, uh, there's a, uh, I think I said this in one of the lectures, uh, the version of second law I like the best is the one that says, um, the most likely thing to happen, uh, that is the, the macro state with the most number of micro states, most likely thing to happen, happens most of the time. It sounds like a tautology, uh, because it is, it is. <laughs> and, uh, if it's a tautology, then you don't need a law to tell you that it's correct. Tautology is, you know, A is equal to A. Like, if that's not true, then your system of logic is in trouble. So, it's, so really these laws of thermodynamics are not, um, they are more of a useful reminders. They are not real laws in that, um, it's a necessary beginning point for a system of, um, Systematic theory, uh, physical theory. So, um, so anyways, um, so, <laughs> so, and, uh, so let me just end this uh, portion with uh, the reference to the one section that I sometimes bring in because this is the, I think, a section that talks about Maxwell's demon. It's a quite illustrative way of um, how Feynman argues through uh, difficult things. So sometimes, uh, you know, we think through... Um, paradox, uh, thought experiments, uh, paradoxical situations, and um, thinking through that can help develop your own understanding of subtle points of an, um, of an argument. And here you have a thought experiment involving a mechanical system and some thermodynamic system. And the question here is, hey, you can, can you build, build a mechanical system like this? Um, 
where through this mechanism of ratchet, uh, this is made to turn in only one way, increasing potential energy of this and just uh, continuously taking heat energy out of this uh, reservoir. And I you know, read through the thing, and I think he, uh, he should bring up the idea of Maxwell's demon somewhere. Um, it does it not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's something about Maxwell's demon somewhere up here. And yeah, for historical interest, and device invented Maxwell, and so on. And <laughs> he has, uh, um, he has something about demon being too hot. Uh, simple as demon, yes. Yeah, so. Okay, yeah. Um, let's uh, use some that. Um, you know, he doesn't have that uh, punchline. Uh, he must have that in one of his other lectures. But um, this is, uh, uh, you know, interesting. So with the thermodynamics, I think there are things that people have difficulty quite internalizing. You know, if you've ever heard of people talking about perpetual motion machine, um, I imagine the 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 obsession with the perpetual motion motion machine is because people have difficulty reconciling themselves to the fact that a machine like this, which on um, to the untrained eye might look like it might be possible to use the collisions of gas molecules here to turn it this one way, increase mechanical energy here. Doesn't work that way. Um, and um, so, so this is the section that I sometimes bring in, but this semester I, it just never came up, so I never really brought in, but <laughs> you can read it here. It's accessible to you, just uh, uh, free. So that's the thermodynamics uh, portion that if you want to, you can go back and look. But uh, as I keep saying, we are done with the thermodynamics. And my really one of the main goals in the remainder of the semester is to refer as little to thermodynamics as possible. So if you're looking for, OK, um, what about ENM? Uh, he has one section, one chapter here that um, that related to EMM, <laughs> chapter 28. But you know, I think he actually repeats this in volume two. So let me not refer to this because I think you can actually uh, skip to volume two and in volume two, there will be something that's uh, basically a copy of that. So volume two is where he covers mainly electromagnetism. And I don't know if I've read through the whole uh, volume. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, again, does a bit of uh, um, unusual introduction. So I think what it talks about here, it's something that we will get to. Yeah. By the end of the semester, I am going to, uh, well, I think you have seen uh, dot products and cross products. And, um, and... Let's see, not this. Uh, the differential calculus stuff, we'll talk about that at some point. And there is, a, does he talk about gradient? Yeah, yeah, gradient. <laughs> and uh, there's something about Laplacian that he'll probably bring up. Um, and there's a gradient, gradient, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, that's the gradient operator. and. Um, and then uh, you can do that product with uh, the gradient, um, divergence, and uh, curl. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Um, this class has uh, Math 3C as a uh, core record. And these are operations that I think you will see in Math, math 3C. And But the thing is, at this point, at the beginning of the semester, you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> so... Um, uh, but uh, again, Feynman doesn't feel he is bound to the traditional order in which people cover things, so he brings this right at the beginning. But uh, one of the thing, wonderful thing about Feynman lectures is that these lectures are self-contained, and that's a feature that you will often find, especially in upper division physics and engineering, because um, as these uh, fields of study specialize, um, I mean. You know, I mathematicians know how to do calculus. They know how to do differential equations. But the kind of emphasis that a mathematician would place is 
different from the kind of emphasis that physicists would find useful. And the kind of things that Feynman talks about here, um, it's frankly the sort of thing that we physicists <laughs> understand better than mathematicians. Because uh, mathematicians might know what a vector field is, but um, you know, I question how many know the applications of a vector field. Because we are the application people. So, but anyways, it's here. You can take a look at it. Uh, but the, the, I guess uh, where we are this week is probably closer to right here. Um, electrostatics, you know, Coulomb's law, <laughs> okay, electric potential. We're going to introduce that in two weeks. Um, uh, like this stuff here. Again, okay. Feynman does these things in a non traditional order. But I think it's really useful for people to read this through because it is a self contained lecture, and reading it through will um, give you better understanding than just reading our textbook or just watching my lectures. Um, and so, yeah, this uh, volume two is going to match up reasonably well with what we are covering for the remainder of the semester. Um, things like uh, dielectrics, uh, he co goes into more details than we have, uh, uh, I have uh, ability and time to. So do take a look at like chapter 11. I think that'll be, that's a good background for people to have. And uh, let's see here. Does he do circuit stuff? He might not do circuit. Oh, uh, yeah, he does do some circuit stuff. Um, yeah, things like a principle of least uh, action. It's a uh, um, it's a really historically important principle. Um, we won't be doing a lot with it, but it's uh, the kind of thing. If you take um, upper, upper division mechanics, this is the kind of thing that you will hear echoes of when you take upper division mechanics. Um, yeah, where is wave guys? We don't do. <laughs> and, okay, so this is getting to special relativity, Lorentz transformation. That's for physics per se. We don't do anything with that. Um, he should have some electromagnetic wave stuff. Where is it? Um, yeah, so there are some chapters you will notice, hey, we don't cover it. Yeah, we don't. But Feynman uh, both covers more material than what a typical lower division engineering physics class does because, you know, he was teaching at Caltech. Um, I'm sure that's one of the reasons. <laughs> and, um, and he, uh, yeah. Um, I thought there was a... Maxwell's equations... Oh, uh, is this it? Maybe this is uh, what it is. Yeah, solutions of Maxwell's equations and yeah, yeah. Review this and um, yeah. So when you get to chapter twenty of volume two, then you will see this reference to volume one. So if you somehow if you didn't look at volume one, then there it is. Yeah, yeah. So this is another resource. Um, that I, each semester I keep trying to bring more of this in and sometimes I fall behind on other stuff and um, covering stuff from this becomes uh, less of a priority. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> um, it, it's there for you to look at for those uh, people who want to, who want additional material to look at beyond what's just available within the course.